Hi. Today, in our little how to improvise sort of thing, um, I would like to go over melody um, and how melody can help us build better improvisations. Um, a lot of times as jazz musicians, uh, especially chordal players, guitar players and piano players, we end up delegating the melody thing to the singer, to the saxophone player, to the trumpet player. And we don't really think of the melodies as being important. And we start to learn how to play songs by playing the chord progression. And we just, when we solo, we just solo over the chord progression. And some, there's, I've seen some people that don't know the melody to the song that they're playing. And I think that's in some ways a disservice to the rest of the band, musicians in the band. It's a disservice to the composer of the song. Um, a lot of these songs have very simple progressions, a one, six, two, five sort of thing with a one, six, two, five. So they, they may go on and on and on and do the same chords over and over and they're totally different melodies. So who's to say whether you're soloing over I've Got Rhythm or um, Heart and Soul? It's, you know, they're, they're different songs, but they have essentially have the same chord progression um, I know that the the simple version of heart and soul that most people play is one six four five but um, if you look at uh, Hoagie Carmichael's original it's one six two five um, but okay so what we want to talk about is how we can take the melody and make it help us in our improvisation um, if you take a song like um, my romance and we just play the melody we can do the melody with pretty much one finger. But that's just the melody, right? Now we can do little improvisations on the melody, but if we take the melody and we we learn the melody, and we really learn the melody, but we learn the melody with chords. Take either three or four note voicings in our right hand. That sort of thing we suddenly give ourselves some information that helps in our improvisation so this is a, we can do a lot of different we could do a bunch of different types of 13th chords here because the, the melody is essentially the 13th on this F chord when we start and I played a wrong chord there somehow I don't know what I did there um, <laughs> but here we go so we can play just a simple 13 without any ninth. We can play the regular ninth. We can play the flat ninth. But here's the thing, when we, when we do that sort of thing, then we're informing ourselves. So when we approach that intro in our solos, approach it in our solos if we've taken the time to take those chords maybe we want to start with this with a flat nine and then we, we go to the B B flat major chord you could put the ninth in there and you can get a tremendous amount of improvisation just within the within the notes underneath the melody.
So just understanding how to build like a three or four note chord voicing underneath each melody note that so that works with the chord that you're playing. And when I say three or four note voicing, if you can put a, a seventh, uh, if the melody is like in the case of the first note of this, the melody is the sixth. So if you put the third and the seventh underneath it, that's great. And if you can put the sharp, sharp nine, hmm, how does that sound? That's a little hairy. <laughs> so we put the regular uh, ninth or the flatted ninth. Those both sound very nice and you can use them within your improvisation. And then when you get to the one chord, which is the B flat, um, it doesn't make much sense to go with a really altered voicing because we, the, that's, you're not going to put a sharp nine on a major seven chord. So you just don't do it. It's um, the jazz police will come to your house um, for that sort of thing. Um, so after that, we go to the four chord, major seven. to a D minor seven, and a C sharp diminished seven. So diminished seven, they give you. You can use the notes of the diminished seven chord as some sort of arpeggio and. And then we get to the C minor. minor F7 so you can do whatever kind of two five runs you like to do before you go back to the one um, so all those things all, all, all of those chords they have lots of notes within them that you can use to sort of learn different things you can do in your improvisational style now part two of this because that was just part one of um, talking about the melody part two of this is Understanding certain things about melodies to begin with. Um, I, in, in teaching some of my beginner students how to understand what, um, what key you're in, a lot of times the student says, I don't understand how to understand what key you're in. And pretty much a high percentage of music in Western, Western traditional music tends to work in a certain way so that the last note of the melody pretty much tells you what key you are in. You were in, um, whether it's major or minor, um, if the last note of the melody is G, and you had a lot of B flats and F sharps in it, you're probably in G minor. Um, if the last note of the song is, in, is a G, and you had a lot of F sharps, but a lot of B naturals, and it wasn't, you're probably in the key of G. Um, if you end on a major chord and, and your melody note is G, you're probably in the key of G, although that with the Picardy third that happens in some um, very old classical music, um, that's a different story. Um, but you would, you would have seen a lot of G minor chords. Um, Um, you would have seen a lot of G minor chords within the, the, the older classical music that ends on a Picardy third. So that's, but still, if your last melody note is G, you're probably either in G major or G minor. So now the reason I'm telling you this is um, in the art of writing melodies, there is something interesting that I've noticed. Um, and uh, it actually, I noticed it when I was trying to teach one of my younger students about how to understand you know, when you look at a melody, what key you're in. And it came to me when I was, I just used as an example, um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And a very interesting thing about this melody that shows it's a, like a very, very well constructed melody is the fact that it is definitely, if you do it in the key of C, and you listen to the end of each one of these little phrases, um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Start with G. It does go to a C right away. But the end of the first little phrase is a D. The end of the second little phrase is an E. 
Third phrase goes to a D. Fourth phrase ends on a G. Then it ends on a D. Another D. F. E. Another F. And it finally comes to a rest on the C at the very end of the whole melodic structure, which is amazing when you think about it because it's it's been in C the whole time. There's never been a time when you didn't feel like you were in the key of C if you understand the key of C. But the resolution, he holds off until the very end. Every one of those phrases, he leaves you sort of a little bit hanging. Not, you know, we're definitely in the key of C, but he leaves you hanging. That's not do. That is neither. Not do. Still. Yes, and the exception of my weird wrong note there. Um, so the whole song keeps going, and it finally comes to a rest on the C at the very end. And that's not, it's not a quality that's only within that song. Um, I actually made a list of a whole bunch of songs that, that do very similar things. Um, the Days of Wine and Roses, uh, the, that one is in the, if you're in the key of F. Uh, that first one's C, D, D flat, C, A, G, C, D, D flat. Finally, at the very end of the melodic structure, it comes to a rest on an F. Um, now, this is something I never even thought about um, until I was trying to show it to, one, you know, trying to explain to one of my students how the song ends on the C. Um, but I've noticed it in a whole bunch of songs. It's it, in How High the Moon, which changes keys a bunch of times. It changes from the key of G to the key of F to the key of E flat. Oh, I just did something weird. <laughs> I played a major seven after playing some uh, regular um, triads. Um, <laughs> that would have made a little bit more sense. Um, but we're in the key of, we start off in the key of G, goes to the key of F, goes to the key of E flat, but it resolves to the key of G. And I don't think there's a, uh, the end of that first phrase is a B. Then that phrase ends on a B flat. That phrase ends on an A. That phrase ends on an A flat. Now this is weird because it spends a long time on these G. This is in the key of E flat at this point. So it, it hangs on that G, but it doesn't really end the phrase there. And when it's the, it gets to the E flat phrase, So, so we don't even get the resolution on G at that point, even when we were in the key of E flat. Back to the B. Starts all over again um, for the second eight measures. So there's B, B flat, A, A flat. B, and at the end of the melodic structure, it ends on a G again. 
This is a very important thing to understand when you're writing a song, um, and it's probably a very good thing to understand when you're learning these songs. Um, uh, there's a, th a thing, um, uh, never a, a, a funny, funny phrase that um, um, somebody on YouTube um, that is a very silly person um, who's a flat earther, um, makes, always makes me laugh when I hear him talk um, because he has all these phrases he likes to say, like, uh, never get giving the game away, that sort of thing. So when you, um, when you resolve to the G in your melody too soon, if you're in the key of G, you sort of put, you put like a, take all the steam out or all the, all the air out of the sails or whatever you want to say. Um, if you, if you hold off on going to that, um, do as in do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do, if you, if you go to do immediately, it sort of loses the steam that you've built up, um, in your phrasing. If you, um, if you, if you've, if you uh, resolve all of your phrases to one, then it doesn't seem like uh, doesn't seem like you're going anywhere. I mean, your solos. Um, if you can find ways to resolve in other places, that's a really good thing. Um, and this is something I didn't really pay attention to much until a little while ago. So it's something that hopefully I will be able to put into my own improvisations also. Um, but there are a lot of different songs that use this, that do the same thing. How Insensitive is very interesting. Um, it's a song by Jobim, and it starts on the five, and it sort of just very slowly works its way down to one. Uh, sophisticated Lady, um, it when we get to the end of the second A section, it finally resolves to the key that we're in. Um, the phrase ends with the... Um, it's in, if you're in the key of A flat, it finally gets there um, at the end of the second A section, and then the bridge immediately takes it off into La La Land, and it comes back to... Um, so, I mean, that one's a really cool one because it's... So we start with a... We're in the key of A flat, and we start with a G flat on, on the F7 chord. And then we get this... So that one ended on the major seven. So now we're on the five, uh, the six, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the, the five of the two chord, which is the six of the one chord. Um, keep that in mind. Um, uh, what are we, uh, B flat minor chord, right? So this is the end of the A section, goes to the major seven. Back to that F7 with a flat nine. Back to your major seven. To the six. finally get back to Do there. So there we're in the key of A flat and then so we finally resolve but then it immediately goes to an A minor 7 D7 So none of those resolve to the A flat at all. Um, back to the top, well, the third A section. So 
So it finally really comes to an ending on the, again on the last A section. But um, so it's a sort of a, a, I think it's a melody writer's skill to write a melody that's very, very interesting that doesn't keep resolving to one. Um, and that's something to take into account when you're trying to improvise, I, I guess. Um, and I'm going to personally try to take in that into account. I tend to just improvise um, without thinking too much. Um, uh, I should start thinking more is what I'm trying to say. Um, but in any case, um, there's a lot of different ones that, that do a lot of very similar things. Um, but if when you're next time you learn, learn a song, take into account the melody. Um, look at what key you're in and see whether your melody resolves to the one early in the song or whether it holds off until the very end of the song. Uh, I know there's, there's one song that sort of does it very quickly that I always find interesting because it never seems to me like it's dying away at the, like on its resolution, which is... Oh, wait, I don't play that. I play this chord. So the melody... So it does go back to Do almost immediately. So that's... But I tend to put... I put a... A dominant. I, I put the one chord with a dominant seven uh, with a flat five, uh, so we get the whole tone scale there. So that sort of thing. Um, if you do get the one resolving too early, you can like fool around with it and and do something like a whole tone chord um, because a whole tone chord definitely makes it seem like you haven't resolved <laughs> there's nothing r less re resolution based than a whole tone chord <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if I have all that much more to say about all of this sort of thing um, I just wanted to maybe do a little bit of a uh, talk about melody um, there's a lot of different, th there's a lot of things you can do about with melody, but I'm going to say right now that one of the best things you can possibly do with your melodies is learn them and learn how to harmonize them with chords for each melody note. When you do that, then you can take those little chords and work with them, <laughs> basically. Um, and that's all I got to say about all this. Um, this is not a terribly uh, important theoretical lesson. It's just learn your chord, learn learn your melodies, and and harmonize them because the harmonies that you put with your chords in your right hand will help you to improvise. That's it. <laughs>